having a positive perspective on the events of your life is a way that the brain demonstrates resilience to the stresses which we all encounter um, every single day. That's interesting. And that actually plays into physical brain health. Absolutely. Welcome to Your Body, the health cast that takes a deep dive inside your health. No matter what kind of health issue you're experiencing, whether it's the common cold, a bad case of eczema, heart disease, or breast cancer, it affects you in every way, physically, mentally, emotionally, and internally. This podcast seeks to understand what is going on with our bodies from the inside out, from our heads to our toes, and everything else in between. We're going to look at health issues from every angle and hopefully get a better understanding of what's going on with our bodies and how we can better take care of them. I'm your host, Stephanie Landon, Editorial Manager at RadNet, a leader in outpatient imaging services and an advocate of patient empowerment for over 35 years. I learned so much from doing this, uh, from going through this, uh, in how our quality of life is just so relative. Yeah, uh, I dealt with it, and it was it was horrific. And and looking back now, I don't know how I did it. Friends, uh, family were like, "I don't know how you do this," and you just learn to adapt. What would you do? You have a pain in your head, your mouth, your neck. It doesn't go away, and you know it's not normal. Or what if you have a stroke or a brain tumor? or a brain injury. How strong are you? And how resilient is your brain? We're back with part two of our two-part series, Your Amazing Brain, where we've been looking at a variety of aspects concerning the brain, how it works, how it's organized, what happens if something goes wrong, and how to keep it healthy. If you missed part one, I highly recommend you go back and listen to it. We had some really fascinating conversations with a few people who experienced various brain episodes, including Jeff Probst, host of TV Survivor, which was really cool and crazy. You have to hear his story. We also got some perspective from Dr. Susie Bash. She's the medical director of neuroradiology at San Fernando Valley Interventional Radiology in Los Angeles. And we'll hear from her again in this episode, along with some other really interesting guests. Ultimately, I want to try to answer the one big question I keep coming back to. Just how resilient is the brain? They drill a hole in the back of your head about the size of a quarter uh, mm. and then go in and, and put, as it was described to me, like a cotton ball made of Teflon in between the artery and the nerve. And it's, wow. just, that, it's just that mechanical. It's just like putting a piece of duct tape on something. It's yeah. just that simple. And then they patch you back up with what he described as brain spackle. Oh and uh, it either works or it doesn't. If you know the Grammy-winning, world-famous rock band, the Foo Fighters, you're probably familiar with the group's bass guitarist, Nate Mendel. He happens to be a super smart, really nice, down-to-earth guy. What you might not know is that he endured several years of unbearable pain from what ended up being a nerve condition in his brain. I'm going to let you hear about it directly from him, but just imagine, he's touring the world with the Foo Fighters, playing on live TV, flying all over on planes and staying in hotel rooms. All the while, he's in so much pain that he sometimes couldn't even speak. I found out eventually that I uh, had a thing called trigeminal neuralgia. And um, what happened initially is, this is like the mid-90s, like brushing my teeth. That's really where I started brushing my teeth. And I just get like a, a sharp... Uh, like a burning electrical, as if you were uh, having dental work done, but you hadn't uh, gotten properly numbed. It was oh. like that. Nerve oh. pain. Uh-huh. I'm just sharp, but and it would go away. Like, oh, well, that was uncomfortable and just sort of forgot about it. Right. Two weeks later, it would happen a couple of times with brushing my teeth. And then a week later, it would happen three times. And it just sort of would ramp up over time. And then, so I, I figured it was a broken tooth or something like that. That seemed like the easiest solution. So I went to the dentist and they said, well, nothing's wrong. Maybe took some x-rays. I forgot and left it at that. Like, well, you know, we can pull the tooth. I, I remember dentist saying that, like, well, we can pull this, pull this tooth if you'd like, but it's, I don't, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, it was very frustrating for me as a patient because yeah. you, uh, anticipate that, you have a, some sort of malady and you go to uh, a professional and they diagnose it and then you get to the treatment. Right. And that was that, that system broke down for me uh, in trying to diagnose what my problem was. It was enormously frustrating as this condition is starting to ramp up. And uh, just quickly, I'll describe what it is. Yeah. Uh, 
trigeminal neuralgia, you've got the two main facial nerves uh, on either side of your face uh, are called the trigeminal nerves because there's three branches. One goes to your eye, one goes to your nose, and one goes to your mouth. Mm -hmm. And in this uh, condition, you have, the, uh, you have an artery, a main artery in the back of your uh, head. It's pressing down on that trigeminal nerve. It breaks through the myelin sheath and causes it to uh, misread sensation as pain. Um, and uh, it's what they call cryptogenic. There's no cause for it, and they don't know why it happens. So oh, wow. uh, that's what I had. And it, was, uh, it uh, used to be called the suicide disease because before they knew what it was or how to treat it, it was, it was so horrific that you know, it, it got that name. Nice. Uh, anyways, so I'm continuing to try to figure out what's going on. Uh, and my mouth is becoming less and less useful over time as, um, talking, brushing my teeth, eating, you know, any, any use of your mouth, um, it is, becomes, it's your body just reads it as pain instead of whatever <laughs> sensation it should so be eating it at. Yeah. It's just getting progressively worse. Progressively worse over time. And yeah. I've gone to maybe seven or eight dentists over the course of three or four years and each each one of them uh says the same thing and this after i figured out what was wrong with me i it was a great realization for me with the medical prof profession because um dentists aren't trained to look for signs of trigeminal neuralgia they're not neurologists they're dentists mm -hmm. but i just couldn't help but think and people uh, I did a quite a bit of research on this uh, condition after I was diagnosed. And so I, I know a lot about it and I know that a lot of people get teeth pulled unnecessarily. <gasps> and then now they're missing a tooth and they still have the pain. Ugh. Horrific. Right. Ugh, uh -huh. And I'm like, how, how, how difficult would it be to insert one question on the test to get your dentist certification or whatever it is that just, shows that you know how to look for signs of trigeminal neuralgia yeah think of all the needless suffering right um and you know and of course you know, you know there's there's going to be gaps in in any professional's knowledge but but geez it's just come on guys like mm -hmm. could, could yeah. you just add that to the curriculum in dental school uh and maybe they have by now i don't know it's done in, it's been a minute so anyways what i finally did was uh i was on tour I'm a touring musician, and I was in Europe, I remember, and I just couldn't take another day of it. And uh, I remember I was outside of a hotel in Amsterdam getting ready to go to a show, and I just opened up a bottle of whiskey. I was like, <sighs> I, I, can't, I can't do it anymore. And, uh, you know, I, <laughs> it, was, it was horrible. And I, I got through that little period, and, and yeah. we ended up on tour in a, a stop in New York. And I had a day off and I remember I said to myself, I'm going to go because obviously whiskey isn't the solution. I'm going to go to every doctor in town until somebody tells me what's going on. And I went to three. I went to another dentist who referred me to a like a root canal specialist person oh my God. who probably did know what I had because he referred me to a neurologist. And it was so dramatic. <laughs> Just I remember this. I went in. Uh, and it was like a classic medical office, all wood paneling and a you know, shelf of books behind him. And I explained to this doctor what was going on. He didn't say anything to me. He just went behind him himself. To, he went, went, it, it turned around, grabbed a book off the shelf, opened it up, turned it around to me and said, you have this. And how many years had it been at this point? About five. <laughs> you have trigeminal neuralgia and he said uh we're going to give you uh some of this medication and that's the way that uh, that uh you know we'll, we'll, we'll tell whether you have it or not because of the pain is reduced um then and, you know you have this mm -hmm. and immediately it was weird psychoactive thing too because immediately after i found out what the diagnosis was i got a, t a temporary uh relief from the pain i don't ah. know what happened it was just so so strange it didn't last long. Then I started the journey of, of treatment and figuring out what to do about it. Yeah. So then, okay, so go on. So you took some medication and then, so were you seeing this neurologist in New York? Uh, I was living in Seattle at the time. So okay. I, uh, I went back home and I, I got a neurologist there. Yeah. And uh, I'm forgetting what the original anti-epileptic drug they gave me was. Oh, um, it was an anti-epileptic. 
that is the main course yeah. of treatment. Yes. And uh, those are very strong drugs and they've got a lot of side effects. Yeah. And it, it didn't work particularly well. Mm-hmm. And uh, it, it was a classic uh, case of, uh, you know, the more effective the treatment, the more the larger the dose, the higher the side effects. So you're yeah. trying to balance that out. But it's not really working. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm fighting this thing that I'm increasingly starting to see as uh, you know, like I'm anthropomorphizing it, if that's the correct word. I, I, it's becoming a person. Right. The 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 illness, the, the pain, because um, and if there happens to be anybody uh, listening that has ever had trigeminal neuralgia, you'll immediately know what I'm talking about because um, it's these sharp bursts of pain. Let's say you're trying to brush your teeth. Yeah. And uh, you see, you're working, you're working really lightly, and you're kind of working around the area, and you got to go in there, and you got to brush that that area, and it's you, uh, it's like touching a live wire, right? <sighs> and you can kind of do it, and you can kind of get the teeth brushed, or eat the food, or get the sentence out, but you kind of have to work around it slowly, and you're you're like boxing with this thing, you know? And yeah. If you, if you get too close, you're going to get punched in the face, you know? So you got to keep your fists up, and you're you're bobbing and weaving and doing the thing. But if you miscalculate and you you want you know you you need to get your teeth brushed in a hurry and you just like get your way through it and uh, you you fight with this thing too hard it'll do what I used to call locking, which mm-hmm. was horrific. So instead of a, a sharp burst of pain, it would just turn on for about a minute or two, Ugh. and just you're just you know, immobilized. Right, and it was crazy. Oh um, God, and the worst experience I had with that was, uh, playing on live television with Saturday Night Live. And, uh, you know, it would, it would lock at, at the worst, maybe a couple of times a day or something like that for, you know, a minute, two minutes, three minutes, something like that. And I got, I got it to lock, uh, uh for whatever reason, right in the middle of a live performance on Saturday Night Live. And I just had to sit there and play my bass while, uh. um, having this pain course in my body. It was, it was insane. So how was it eventually treated? cured i uh so the treatment the you can get surgery Mm -hmm. and all my neurologists and there's a few different surgeries uh and they're invasive and dangerous and they've got side effects and i was uh, counseled to stay away from them from every neurologist that i I saw and i saw a few of them like now if the medication's working it wasn't really but the medication's working that don't go to you know, don't even consult with a surgeon because the surgeon will tell you to get surgery. That's what they do. Right. right. And you don't want the surgery. Um, okay. So I got uh, enrolled in an experimental uh, drug uh, study mm-hmm. out of the uh, University of Pittsburgh. Um, that went on for a couple of years where um, every month I would uh, take a red eye flight out <laughs> to the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, take a taxi over to the doctor that was administering the study and uh, get an exam and then turn around and fly home. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, they would ask for the number of uh, attacks I'd have per day to see how well the medication was, was working or not working. Uh, and so I went and bought one of those clickers that people will use when you know they're counting attendance at a concert or something right. like that. Like, click, click, click. And I'd carry it in my pocket. And that was what I did to count the number of attacks I had, uh, that drug ended up not, uh, being productive. So the study was canceled. And then I started using trileptol and that, that was very effective. It basically took care of the problem, had some side effects, uh, in cognition, uh, primarily mm-hmm. yeah. uh, a little bit of fogginess. And, uh, eventually, uh, I moved to Portland and I I got a new neurologist there and he didn't say the same thing that all the other neurologists had said. He's like, well, you know, we've got, uh, there's actually a specialist here, Dr. Kim Birchall at OHSU, uh, which is a research hospital in Portland. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he is a world renowned specialist, uh, in trigeminal neuralgia. You should go talk to him. I did. And he's like, Oh, let's, let's fix this. Um, and there was a couple of different surgeries. Uh, the, the one that's the most effective was the brain surgery. They just actually, they drill a hole in the back of your head about the size of a quarter, uh, mm-hmm. and then go in and, and put, as it was described to me, like a cotton ball made of Teflon in between the artery and the nerve. And it's wow. just that, it's just that mechanical. 
It's just like putting a piece of duct tape on something. It's yeah. just that simple. And then they patch you back up with what he described as brain spackle. Oh my and God. Uh, it either works or it doesn't. And after a period of time, usually five to 20 years, for whatever reason that they don't know. Uh, and this, this is interesting. I, I couldn't believe that the, uh, a specialist with, with this much knowledge was uh, <laughs> this open about his profession. I said, well, why after five to 20 years would it yeah. stop working? Uh, and so well, we don't know. I was like, well, what do you do when you go back in to fix it? He's like, you just kind of jiggle it around. Oh, <laughs> that's amazing. And he's like, and for whatever reason it works. I was like, it can't be that simple. There's no way. <laughs> so they would have to drill another hole, go in and just jiggle the little Teflon cotton ball around. And then you'll be good to go again. So I've got that to look forward to. It's yeah, been I about was good. 15 years. So, uh, you know, fingers crossed. And he was, <laughs> this was the guy. I mean, if you're going to, if you're going to get yeah. uh, a microvascular decompression surgery, which is what wow. it's called. Uh, I recommend Kim Birchall. I, I have a I have a strong uh, intuition that I'm not going to have to have it done, but it's it's always in the back of my mind if I get some phantom pain in my mouth. I'm like, oh god, here we go. Well, that's what I was going to ask uh, you. If you live with that kind of like little germ of worry. Yeah, I mean, because you know how it is. Your body just throws out odd aches and pains. Yeah. For no reason, sometimes, yeah. and and event sometimes they show up in my mouth. I'm like, and I get that feeling and. It's not an overwhelming sense of dread because I'm I'm young enough and healthy enough to get the surgery again. Yeah. Um, it's much more common in older people. That was another thing that was very odd for me. I you know, at uh, in my early 30s, um, actually earlier than that, I was in my 20s. It, hmm. it just doesn't happen to people in, in their 20s. Um, yeah. And uh, and they don't know why. I'm surprised that so many dentists, I mean, and, and you would go to so many dentists and they'd see that you'd been to so many dentists that, you know, took so many before one finally said, you should go to a neurologist. I, it's, it's a bit mind boggling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think there's about 50,000 cases at a time. I remember seeing that, that figure at some point, about yeah. 50,000 cases at a time in the United States. So rare, but not that rare. Yeah. Right. I think most, you know, I, th I feel like most dentists have seen somebody with trigeminal neuralgia. Yeah. So uh, they should, uh, it, it's pretty shocking that I wasn't referred to a neurologist sooner. Yeah. Maybe because you were age. I wonder. That's a, you know what? I had never actually considered that. Maybe mm -hmm. they had. Maybe there's like, this is something that happens with elderly, yeah. uh, can show up in elderly folks. And uh, they just, they ruled me out. Right. Could have been. Yeah. Maybe they just dismissed it. So now you have no pain. Yes, I'm completely symptom free. You're pain free. That's it, it amazing. Is, yes, absolutely pain free. And uh, I am eternally grateful for my neurosurgeon. Wow. Really uh, improved my life substantially. The take home for anybody is if you're not getting better, get another opinion. Mm -hmm. You should be trying to get well. You're responsible for your own health. I feel like it's time to speak to a neurologist. For anyone who doesn't know exactly, a neurologist is a medical doctor who has specialized training in diagnosing, treating, and managing disorders of the brain, spinal cord, peripheral nerves, muscles, and the involuntary nervous system that controls the heart, lungs, and other organs. Hello, Dr. P.B. Anderson. Hi, Dr. Anderson, it's Stephanie Landon. Oh, Stephanie. Thanks Hi. for calling. Oh, no. Thank you. Thank you so much. How uh, are you? Hey, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, good. Dr. Peter Ryan Anderson has both a medical degree and a PhD, and he's a neurologist practicing in California. He treats a variety of neurologic symptoms, including headache, head injury, numbness, weakness, neck and back and limb pain, seizures, memory disorders, and tremors. I thought it might be a good idea to speak to him about some of the things we've been discussing with our guests. The first question I wanted to ask you is when does someone or when would someone, yeah, see a neurologist? I would say you could see a neurologist for any kind of neurologic symptom, mm -hmm. um, but in general, uh, what would be a symptom that would be memory, pain, speech, uh, um, tremor, gait, numbness, uh, weakness, um, uh, in terms of symptoms, yeah. um, 
But in general, uh, most of my patients are coming to me having seen their primary MD and having been uh, referred. But in, 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 this, in this world, um, um, I don't see any reason why somebody could go directly to a neurologist if they wanted to, um, mm-hmm. particularly, you know, um, so many people are online now and, yeah. and very informed about all kinds of conditions, migraines, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and the like. So I, I am very happy to, to see anybody... Um, you know, straight off the street with, with, with symptoms or signs without any problems. So the take home is, um, you know, you, you'd see a neurologist in general for uh, conditions that represent those symptoms are, are listed yeah. that you, you cannot get treatment from your um, primary MD for. Right. And, and sometimes primary MDs are perfectly capable of treating these things and, 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 and just would like backup and um, um, a, a, you know, a, a additional opinion or someone to follow. And a lot of my work is exactly that. I, I'm not adding anything but, but providing reassurance and explanation and, and having seen more, more patients with that condition can, can give those patients a, um, a broader um, view of, of the future and, and what sort of spectrum of condition they have and, and, what, they can, and uh, what, what, what they can expect. Right. One of the um, interviews that we did earlier um, was someone who had had trigeminal neuralgia and he had spent five years in just, you know, debilitating pain and kept going to dentists because the pain, you know, sort of localized in a tooth. And he went to spent five years going to dentists before finally one of the dentists said to him, "Um, you need to go to a neurologist. So... um, you know, I it's just crazy that he spent that long before someone finally realized that he should go to a neurologist. And I just, you know, wonder if there's, you know, some way people couldn't just know. I mean, I guess, you know, if he thought it was in a tooth, he thought it was in a tooth. But, you know, for us as yes. pe- patients to know, you know, that that it's something more to go to a, a nurse, a neurologist, you know. Well, I, I, I hear you on that, and I, mm-hmm. I think the way the way to to sort of approach that is to say, if you're not getting better, yeah, you, you should always get a second opinion and never accept that you're done for. Yeah. Um, no matter what kind of health problem that you have, you may have something that isn't treatable by anybody. But boy, it would be nice to see a few people to just make sure about that. And yeah. every physician comes at the problem with a slightly different angle. And, and they've been spending years, and you may have a cumulative experience if you've seen two or three people, of 70 years for a particular condition. Well, that's worthwhile availing yourself of. And yeah. if you have a pain, you know, those symptoms that we discussed at the very beginning, you know, if you're having a pain, um, you know, in general, um, it doesn't matter where it is, that will, will, will ultimately go under um, neurology and then pain management. So. Um, I can totally understand the way this played out. Uh, that happens all the time. I, I see a lot of migraineurs who, who have diagnoses of chronic sinusitis because they, they also have some scan abnormalities, but, but they really have migraines. Right. And, and so this, this can happen. But the take home for anybody is if you're not getting better, get another opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, you should be trying to get well. You're responsible for your own health. Another thing I was curious about is um, the brain itself. Like, you know, I know you do a lot of treatments, which we'll get into, but but is it possible for the brain to heal after an injury or after a stroke or something? Yes, that's a great question. And, of course, it's loaded because it depends what you mean by injury and what do you mean by, by healing. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I would say let me lay down some ground rules. Okay. Unfortunately, for, for reasons that are still not understood, mm-hmm. is the central nervous – basically, your, your nervous system is made up of a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. And the, the central represents the brain and, the, and, the, and the, the spinal cord. And the peripheral is everything that gets attached to that. It comes out from that. And, right. and the, the injury to the brain and the spinal cord, those nerves, neurons, they don't tend to heal in the sense of – Oh, they 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 will 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 grow back. Oh, there's some exceptions, of course. Mm-hmm. Whereas you could cut someone, uh, transect a nerve in the arm or in the leg, and there would be reasonable expectation that that nerve would grow back down and reinnovate, meaning it would track all the way down and get back to the muscle that it supplied. 
Right. Um, that does not happen in, in, in the brain. Of course, the extent that one understands that inhibition or that inability and could reverse that, well, there's no limit to where that would go. But, but so when someone says, can you heal yeah. after a brain injury, as opposed to can you heal after a plexus or nerve or root, that's the peripheral nervous system, there's a huge difference. Mm-hmm. And in, in general, healing to me is, is, is loaded. And the grossest or the most profound would be to say, can you re-innovate? Meaning okay. you've lost the, the copper wiring, you've lost the, the axon. Can that copper wiring of, of, of the nerves find the muscle or the other neuron that it was re, um, uh, related to in the past and reconnect? And, and um, peripheral nervous system, yes, to some degree, and, and central nervous system, very poor. Having said that, um, it is remarkable how there is nonetheless recovery after acute insults. Again, when the, the, the question is, what do you mean by injury? You know, do you mean acute injury or chronic injury or degenerative disease process? You know, acute injury right. might simply be uh, an intoxication um, or um, a closed head injury from a car crash or a fall mm-hmm. uh, or a stroke. So if we, if we just take those for now as, as sort of a, an acute insult, to the extent that you can re- reverse those, well, that's great. You know, um, uh, overdose situations, um, um, a intoxication that produces a profound seizure or set of seizures that goes on. Mm-hmm. Or a, a meningitis attack, uh, right. um, you know, West Nile, or even a meningococcal that gets treated quick, 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 quickly enough. Um, um, you know, there's, there's, it just depends on, on the particular case. And then, then you've got more severe things like 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 like, like, like traumatic brain injury and, and, and stroke. And so, yes, it is it is remarkable how much recovery you get. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that when I see somebody in the hospital mm-hmm. in the first you know, days and sometimes weeks after this, they are a whole lot worse than when I see them again weeks or months or years later. What happens? You know, something changed. Right. And there's obviously some swelling that happens at the time, but there's more. And so there is healing. To the extent, the extent to which we understand that, and how is that happening? Is it other nerves taking over? Is there, is there yet some re innovation? Are the synapses taking over? I, I, I don't I don't know the answer to that because everyone's different and, and it gets mechanistic. But, but but my point is is this one is that it is reasonable to expect recovery in anybody with a with a significant with a significant injury and mm-hmm. to work for that. And the longer that you that you don't see anything, that the more pessimistic one it's reasonable to become. And so the, the next question is, well, how long? And and you know generally months. But, um, you know, um, some injuries can take years, but it's not like it just suddenly happens. Um, right. I mean, we all hear about that and always hope for that, but it, it's hard, you know. And I guess I should also, this, this whole issue of severe brain trauma and somebody in coma, well, anything can happen. But in general, things are relatively linear, and, and the longer it takes, the, 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 the worse the prognosis. There are always exceptions. Yeah. Um, overall, I am very... I'm, I'm optimistic about recovery when I see somebody in the hospital because they tend to be much better when I see them later on. And exactly why that happens with these these, these, these injuries and how how that happens is, is obscure to me. And it's 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 I, I don't believe it's that that identified in the, in the literature either. You know, time yeah. and, and and physical therapy and mobilization. But how does that exactly happen at a cellular level? What's going on? Um, right. I, I, I just think that um, there's a very interesting question, but I, I don't know the exact answer to that, except to say um, it's reasonable to expect um, a recovery no matter what, and you can have healing. And, and the idea that you finish when something happens is nonsense. Yeah. And it's, that is interesting that, that you don't know specifically, because we know that you don't grow new neurons, right? Correct. Correct. So something happens like because you know someone who you know can't walk and then they learn to walk again or learn to talk again or you know things like that i mean something is is healing without the production of new neurons it's it's quite interesting <laughs> you know yes so in, in, in simple models of this when 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 a nervous they transected mm-hmm. you know the other nerves will take over take over that 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 field and that function huh. and so you know um and, and and again, when you, when you have loss of a, a particular muscle, mm-hmm. um, you know other muscles will will 
will support this. So, right. so uh, and it's multi-system too, of course. You know, when you enter the brain, you do all kinds of things. Personality can change, mood mm-hmm. can change, motivation can change. Quite apart from the sort of obvious, can you see? Can you feel? Can you move? Right. Um, function, um, and, and those also change. What about <clears throat> dementia? You know, all, and so Alzheimer's. Dementia is and... a problem. Yeah, yeah. Alzheimer's is, is, is a problem. So first of all, Alzheimer's is a massive problem because yeah, the the the, the, the population of the world is getting older. Yeah, uh, because medicine is better, so more and more people are uh, are alive to to experience the consequences of age. And Alzheimer's is a disease that accumulates the older you are. Hmm. In the U.S., um, about one sixth of America's population at at sixty five um, have uh, Alzheimer's disease, and wow. one third at eighty five. And if you live long enough, you will get it. Wow! And, and so. So this is the this is the, the this problem of accumulating um, numbers of cases with, with with age, and the problem has been to find a drug that slows this down. And there's nothing at present. Yeah, there are drugs that will boost memory. They are not that great, but nothing that slows us down. And and that's where all the the effort is being is being uh, spent right now is to find something in the same way that let's say you took a cholesterol drug to reduce your chances of accumulating enough atherosclerotic disease to produce a stroke or a right. heart attack. Here, what we're looking for is a medicine that you could take, potentially you would take at any age, right. and you would reduce your likelihood. And that's, that's where the, 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 the search is. And, and right now, there, 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 there isn't anything that's been shown. Yeah. Wow. So I guess to that, um, is there anything, though, we can do that, that we are able to do now that we, we to keep our brains sort of youthful? I mean, is there anything? Yeah. Well, yes. So, yes, uh, there is. So the first thing is to say, well, you know, who's likely to get this? What are the things that are bad predictors? Depression yeah. and dementia is a bad combination. Mm-hmm. Uncontrolled diabetes is a bad con- combination. Mm-hmm. Stroke is a bad combination. People who have had more education tend to do a better as well. So in those 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 several factors I gave you, mm-hmm. those are all things to work on before you hit 75, 80. And right. if you are at that age, work on doing those things. So specifically, treating depression is important. Get depression controlled. Now sometimes it's very hard to treat, of course. Yeah. But but sometimes it is it is it is treatable. And 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 going a full circle back to our opening comments that that you and I raised in the very beginning is treat mood disorder aggressively and mm-hmm. and you don't have to treat it with drugs in the first instance but 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 uh, aggressively treat mood disorder so make sure you exercise make sure you regiment your life to the extent that you can reduce your stresses unload it, it's a, a sense of wellness wellness thinking and if you have the clinical condition of depression which is a disease of course that then may be completely unrelated to any stresses at all then treat it aggressively so yeah to be youthful to that extent, and in, in this thing is is to treat your mood disorder to the extent that you can, mm-hmm. to the extent that you can reduce your stress and your mood disorder. People who have um, no depression do better than those who who do in terms of dementia. But that would be it's sort of intuitive. But no matter what you have, you know, your quality of life is a function of your of your mood and your stress perceptions anyway. Yeah. And if I if I could say anything at all about this, is in my experience in treating patients with dementia. I'm, is that those who are exercising do better. So, mm-hmm. I, and I'm not talking about mental exercise, I'm talking about physical exercise. Those people who, who are um, on an exercise bike or walking or uh, in a routine just do better. They, 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 are more, they remain more independent. And while they, they're cognitive, I have no clinical trial data. This is, this is my perception though. They just do better. They have better quality of life perception and to the extent that you are exercising, so that's be the first thing would be you're controlling your moods and your your, your 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 stress levels and perceptions of that and healthy behaviors. The second would be to exercise, and that yeah. would be a, a way of getting a youthful brain. I mean, at the end of the day, what do you mean by youthful? You, you, you mean someone who's not slow. You mean someone who has interests and, yeah. and multiple interests, or as opposed to shrinking interests. It's, it's pushing out rather than retracting. Um, right. And to the extent that you exercising, that's a good thing. And then and how you exercise is individual. But the point is, just do it. 
at that point you didn't really know what, what your what the outcome was going to be in terms of yeah whether you were going to make it or not Jeez. So as, a, as a 20 year old it was pretty scary this is mark lake gear He's actually the composer of the original music we use on this podcast. But when he was in college, doctors discovered that he had a malignant tumor in his brain, a type of cancer called medulloblastoma. This is a tumor that starts in the lower back part of the brain in an area called the cerebellum. The cerebellum is involved in muscle coordination, balance, and movement. Meloblastomas are invasive, rapidly growing tumors that can spread throughout the cerebrospinal fluid and often metastasize to different areas along the surface of the brain and spinal cord. I was, uh, let's see, I was a junior in college. I mm-hmm. was going to the University of Colorado. Um, actually, I was a senior, now that I recall. Um, I, it was probably February or March, and I uh, was I was getting um, headaches every single day for, and it just, it was actually a constant headache that kind of never went away. Mm-hmm. I had some Tylenol, and like, I went up to the uh, clinic, you know, the clinic, on-campus clinic. Yeah. It was in the HMO at the time. Right. And they, uh, I think the first diagnosis was really, oh, go take some Advil. So I went back, took some Advil headache never went away. I made another appointment um, and they prescribed me um, physical therapy. So I went for physical therapy, still nothing went away. And uh, I was walking to class one day. Um, I, I remember it, it was snowing, it was snowing out and I was walking to class in the snow and I started losing my balance hmm. as I was walking. And uh, at that point, between the headache and the balance, I knew there was definitely something wrong. Yeah. So I, I went back to the clinic again, and I asked them to please give me a CAT scan. So See, that's amazing to me. Box. That you knew to ask for a CAT scan. Like, how did you even know to ask for that? I, I don't remember how I knew that to ask for a CAT scan, but I knew that was... I didn't know... At the time, I didn't know what the difference probably was between a CAT scan or an MRI, but I knew that something was wrong because I was losing my balance. Yeah. And the headache just would not go away. Yeah. And... Uh, and so they sent me to Boulder Hospital to get a CAT scan, and um, I think they saw something right away because they sent me back to the clinic. Um, and I remember speaking with a lady from the clinic who, who basically told me that um, I had a tumor, a brain tumor, and um, that I needed to get it removed as quickly as possible. Jesus. So, uh, you know, I was in college, no family nearby. Um, my, I guess my girlfriend at the time and my friend, um, I called them up and I told them and they came to pick me up. They actually had me drive back <laughs> from the hospital to the clinic. That's... After after the cat scan, which I thought was uh, a little strange. Yeah. Um, given, given, given that I was, I couldn't, my balance, it was, I guess the tumor was in an area where it impacted your balance. It was a medulloblastoma tumor. You know, I was probably 21 at the time, maybe 20 at yeah. the time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I don't think they knew at the time whether it was cancerous or not they just wanted to get the tumor removed mm-hmm. so um <clears throat> my parents also had just gotten on a plane to south africa right um just an eight, 18 hour trip so i couldn't really call them oh my god so i called my uncle in my mom's brother who lived in uh, los angeles and he flew out there and met me at the hospital because my surgery 
It was already scheduled, but uh, it was a Friday. I remember the diagnosis. And a Sunday is when I got the surgery to remove the tumor. Wow. Um, so my girlfriend, my friend, and my uncle were there, thankfully. Yeah. Um, I was pretty... At that point, you didn't really know what, what your what the outcome was going to be in terms of yeah. whether you were going to make it or not. Jeez. Uh, as a 20-year-old, it was pretty scary. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, I remember going into surgery uh, and putting me out. So you were uh, out for the surgery? Oh, yeah. They, they basically put you out. The anesthesia. Anesthesia. Will just uh, put me out. Mm-hmm. They wheeled me in, and then I remember just waking up, and my head was taped to a pillow. And uh. My mouth was very like, dry. I guess they were giving me ice chips. Yeah. But I was very thankful to wake, wake up <laughs> and just just be back back in it. And you know what? I think uh, it was actually this happened during spring break. I remember it was the beginning of spring break. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I think my parents at this point had landed in South Africa, and um, and kind of jumped back on the plane and came back for another seventeen hours. So. Oh my God. Um, but I think, uh, yeah. So the, after the surgery, um, I was probably in the hospital for two or three days. They, that's when they told me that they. They, they had biopsied the tumor. The, the, the tumor was removed successfully. They biopsied the tumor, and it was malignant. Mm-hmm. And um, that, that I would have to go through a, a six weeks of radiation on the head, neck, and spine um, just to make sure that the cancer didn't spread anywhere else. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think... Um, I recovered pretty quickly. I mean, I remember being back in class within seven to ten days. I was pretty adamant that I would finish up my senior year. Yeah. So, and it just helped keep my mind up what was actually going on. But, yeah. Um, so I remember going to school with a hat on, you know, because I they they had shaved my hair, my head to do the surgery. Do you have to follow up? at all now, all these years later? Do you do you need to do anything? You know what? Uh, for the first five years, I think I had to do it. Um, I guess for the first year, it was like quarterly MRIs mm-hmm. of the head, neck, spine. And then year two, it was kind of like semi-annual, year three. Um, and I remember them having said that um, after five years, you're, you're you uh, should be okay. Right. Um, I think 85% um, non-recurrence is what they said. It's, interestingly enough, they actually said at one point, one of the doctors, I don't know how valid this is, is that this tumor was in an area, I guess the medulloblastoma tumor is more likely to happen in children than adults. Huh. And, and I don't know what you call 20, a child or an adult. Okay, I'm looking it up right now. It is it is common in children, so you probably had had it. It was probably growing for a while. No, they said it was probably a, uh, a golf ball size when they took it out. Oh, my God. Is, is what they said. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but I mean, once they took it out, the headache was gone. Yeah. I was, a, I was a happy camper. Wow. I could function again. I didn't, um, I managed to get everything out. And all the remnants uh, are gone. But I, I think every five years, every couple years, I like to go back and just make sure that everything's good. So you do? So you go see an a oncologist every couple years? No, yeah, I, I get an MRI. Do you have like a fear of it coming back? Like, what is it? Does it do anything in your day to day life, or do you have a minute that you stop and think about it? I, I would say in the first year or two, yeah, I was worried about it. 
Mm-hmm. Um, I I would say after five years, I pretty much um, I don't really think about it anymore. Right. Um, I feel good. But also want to be just make sure. You know, sometimes I think like, is this a family like hereditary kind of thing? Which I don't think it is. No one in my family ever previously had something. Like that. Right. So, right. But I worry for my kids. Well, that is um, a super interesting story, and it's extremely impressive to me that you knew to ask for a CAT scan. Because I think, you know, one of the things, the purposes of of this podcast is to um, educate and empower our listeners to, to, to be able to, you know, advocate for themselves. If something's not right, you know, to be able to tell your doctor, I need this, you need to look at this. You know, rather than just keep going around and around, you know, because they probably would have keep telling, kept telling you to take aspirin. Yeah, I mean, you know what? I think at the time I was like, um, I really had a hard time with HMOs in that respect, and I don't think I'd ever do an HMO again because of that, of what happened to me. So um, because I felt like it was. Whether it was true or not, I felt like they were kind of slow, slow playing it to, you know, mm-hmm. at a probably a big cost. You know what I mean? Like, I yeah. Felt like I don't know that that's the HMO or just that a lot of times they just don't think it could be, you know, you're young. It doesn't seem you're in college, you know, oh, headaches. If that could be stress or, you know. I think they would not think of that right away, which is why I think, you know, it's important to know your own body and know when you have to advocate for yourself. As we were discussing earlier, you know, when a neuron in the brain dies, it can never regrow. But that doesn't mean that the brain is not uh, resilient to sort of stress and injury that encounters over life. So, I like to think about um, human brain resilience in terms of protective mechanisms of the brain. After speaking with Nate and hearing how he endured five years of horrible pain with trigeminal neuralgia, and then he found a neurologist, had brain surgery, and now he's fine. And then talking to Mark, who had a really serious brain tumor, again, had surgery, had some radiation, and now he's okay. I decided that I finally needed to get to that question I keep coming back to. How resilient is the brain? To try to answer this, I call Dr. Susie Bash again. There are a few different protective mechanisms. So one of those is actually what we call neuroplasticity. And this is the ability of neural networks in the brain to change through reorganization of those dendritic connections that we spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. So individual neurons um, can actually, you know, they can make new connections, which uh, can eventually lead to broader changes, which we call, you know, cortical remapping. And these new connections are a form of brain resilience. Um, They can result from learning new information um, or from environmental influences uh, like um, trauma or let's say stroke or bleed or even psychological stress. And the developing brain um, actually exhibits a higher degree of neuroplasticity than the adult brain, but uh, all adults experience this as well. So this activity dependent plasticity can have significant implications for healthy development and for learning and memory and also for recovery from brain injury. If you still haven't listened to part one of this series on the brain, which again, you should, we first talked to Dr. Bash about the brain a few times in that episode. As I mentioned earlier, she's the medical director of neuroradiology at San Fernando Valley Interventional Radiology in Los Angeles. Another sort of um, uh, protective mechanism of the brain is something called autoregulation. And it's kind of a big word, but um, it's, it's really, it, well, let's think of it this way. The brain is a very highly active organ, and it requires a lot of energy in the form of glucose and also a constant blood supply um, so that it can maintain adequate oxygen levels. Right. And the brain has a very unique, special way of protecting itself from injury. And it does this by regulating its own blood supply. Um, and this is what we call cerebral autoregulation. And this cerebral autoregulation is the ability of our cerebral blood uh, vessels, uh, cerebral just means brain, blood vessels to maintain stable blood flow despite fluctuations in our blood pressure. 
Um, so no matter what's going on, what's happening in our bodies, our brain is working very hard to protect itself. So the smooth muscles in our blood vessel walls of our brain uh, will um, either flex or relax, and that allows the blood vessels to either get bigger or smaller in an effort to maintain that constant blood flow to the brain. And this is really an amazing capability, and it's highly protective of our brain function and our brain integrity. And then, and probably two other sort of uh, protective mechanisms that I think are important to discuss would be emotional stability and also our perspective and perception in life. Mm -hmm. So for emotional stability, much of, much of the work that goes into allowing us to maintain emotional stability actually, um, believe it or not, takes place when we sleep. Um, I know a lot has to do with the ha our upbringing and, and character development, et cetera, but a lot happens when we sleep. So all humans experience different stages of sleep. And those can actually be easily monitored on EEG. But the one stage that people are most familiar with is REM. And, and that's characterized by rapid eye movements, that hence the name REM. And that's our dreaming stage. And a growing body of literature um, suggests that sleep plays a very critical role in emotional processing and adaptability. And we now know that the purpose of our dreams is really to provide that emotional stability throughout our lives. So studies have shown that if you actually keep waking up someone in the middle of their REM and preventing them from ever, you know, entering or completing that REM stage, um, that person actually will become, uh, will quickly become emotionally unstable. And that's how we actually, by doing this experiment, that's how we started to learn the importance of our dreams. So REM sleep loss deteriorates um, both the encoding of emotional information and the emotional memory consolidation process. So that protective role of sleep in human, in, in human emotional um, homeostasis and regulation is really critical for maintaining that great emotional health that we all are striving for. Right. And it's important, an example of our brain's resilience to external emotional stresses that we all encounter in life. Mm -hmm. And so that's very interesting. And the last element is really um, what you were alluding to earlier, and that has to do with our perspective and um, our perception. So right. perspective is the lens through which we view the world. Okay, so all of us have our own perspective on things, and it really determines uh, how we view ourselves, how we view others, and how we view the situations around us. And perception is what we interpret. So it's our understanding of a given situation or person or object. And it's sort of the meaning that we assign to that um, situation that we encounter. So I can't emphasize enough the importance of maintaining a healthy, positive sense of uh, perception and perspective in life. You know, it's very interesting. Like You can take two different people that have the exact same circumstances in life, including all their happy moments and all their tragic moments. And one will say they've had the most wonderful life. And the other one will say they've had the hardest life and everything is always going wrong all the time. And it really comes down to their their difference in their perspective and their perceptions. And this doesn't mean that I, I, I encourage anyone to deny reality. I think it's very important to accept reality. But there's a way that you can view circumstances that can actually help you. Um, it's a protective me a mechanism for you. So having a positive perspective on the events of your life is a way that the brain demonstrates resilience to the stresses which we all encounter um, every single day. That's interesting. And that actually plays into physical brain health. Absolutely. It has huh. a, it has a, a large amount to do with it. I've, really all four things that I mentioned are all ways that we can sort of help protect ourselves against stresses and injury uh, that, you know, that we all, that happens in all of our lives as, yeah. as we go through um, different stages. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting. And so in the way that like um, the neurons or the nerves will sort of reconnect, you know, if there's an injury, does that imply that um, our brains are always developing in a sense? And you can think about it in that way. Um, mm -hmm. I've never really thought about it like that, but you, you certainly can. I mean, Basically, our brains are evolving, and, and not always mm -hmm. for the better. Again, it depends on what's going yeah. on. But, but those connections are forming with each new bit of information that we're learning. Right. And as we discussed earlier, um, you know, the more, um, the more complex and the more, um, you know, detailed the branching becomes, mm -hmm. the deeper ingrained that memory uh, becomes. And so... Um, but yes, the, those connections are always changing. So the number of neurons 
um, is not really, you're not going to gain neurons in life. You know, as we get older, we will eventually, you know, start losing some neurons. And then obviously if we have a uh, significant uh, brain injury, such as a stroke or a brain bleed or something, we're going to lose neurons there. But that doesn't mean that the brain, as I mentioned, is not resilient. I mean, you can form new connections and, and, and form new memories and work around the problem areas uh, that can occur by this sort of neuroplasticity that we discussed. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, um, that's amazing. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, the heart obviously can't do the, that kind of thing, right? That's just exclusive to the brain. Yes. Well, I'm biased today because I'm a neuroradiologist. <laughs> uh-huh. and I think I think the brain is the most fascinating organ in the human yeah. body. And I actually always knew that yeah. I wanted to do something with the brain. I didn't know if I wanted to be a neurosurgeon or a neurologist or a neuroradiologist, but I knew it had to be with the brain because it's just it's something it's the organ in a way that we understand the least, but that right. we're constantly learning. And the more we learn, the more fascinating it gets. So yeah. it doesn't really seem to be a ceiling. <laughs> right. It really is. It's just it's um, it's for lack of a better word, it's mind blowing, you know. It um, is. Yeah. <laughs> and I like yeah. that word. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Okay, so that's that's reassuring, actually. Let me just say that I realized that while we spoke to several people and heard about quite a few brain issues, I know that there are so many more things that can happen. I mean, we didn't even talk about multiple sclerosis or Parkinson's or brain injury from an accident or even migraine headaches, just to name a few things. I really think we'll have to do another episode in the future on more brain stuff. But in the meantime, I am grateful to all of our guests who shared their stories and their knowledge. And I do feel like I learned a lot about the brain. The fact that it operates as its own protective device is really cool. And the way neurons make new connections to fill in where old or damaged ones die, also really fascinating. In fact, I was just reading that researchers at MIT have been developing a way to synthetically grow these connections between neurons, which are called synapses, in order to find ways to treat certain neurological disorders and diseases, such as autism, Alzheimer's disease, as well as normal memory decline from aging. Many scientists believe that developing drugs that strengthen synaptic connections could be a real solution, which again, is really amazing. So I do think that overall, my big question was answered through these conversations. The brain is pretty resilient, and as human beings, we're pretty strong too. So I'm gonna leave you with one more thought from Nate Mendel to that point. That will to happiness is, is there in people, and you're gonna, you're gonna figure out how to, how to get your dose of it, regardless of what you've gotta go through. On the next episode of Your Body, we're going to dive into immunotherapy. If you're not yet familiar with what this is, you're going to want to tune in because this is very likely the future of treatment for so many diseases, including cancer. Immunotherapy harnesses your body's own immune system to prevent, control, and eliminate disease. We're going to talk to some people who are actually seeing it at work. Thanks for listening. If you want to learn more about this HealthCast or some of our guests, please visit www.yourbodyshow.com. And if you'd like more information about RadNet, check out www.radnet.com. Your Body is produced by Steve Kramer, Doug Smith, and me, Stephanie Landon. Technical and research assistance provided by Joseph Wilson. Executive produced by Paul Colacchio and Karen Morad, all on behalf of RadNet. Original theme music by Mark Lakier. We hope you've enjoyed our HealthCast. Find us wherever you download podcasts.